Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. This is our Friday morning episode and my name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor with My Security Media. We've had a little bit of a break, so it's good to be back. Uh, today, we're focusing on ISARCA's annual research report, The State of Cyber Security. And I'm joined by two US guests, both on the east and west coast uh, of the US, uh, Janaya Marinkovic, uh, who is a virtual CTO CISO uh, and he's with the ISARCA Emerging Trends Working Group and John Brandt, uh, who is the uh, lead of this particular report, second year in a row for John. Uh, we're going to dive into the findings. And this is, I think, the seventh or the eighth report, uh, annual report in this particular field. So it's been really good. And thanks to, to Karen, who works with ISACA, for organising this particular session. Uh, as we do on My Security TV, we cover on aerospace and space, defence and national security, uh, cybersecurity and critical technology and cities and infrastructure. We should be streaming on YouTube, LinkedIn and on Facebook. And this episode will also go out on the Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Uh, and we haven't uh, limited ourselves on time this morning, but uh, we'll probably go to for at least 45 minutes, I'd take it, or we'll finish up on the hour. Just as a uh, sort of update on what we've got coming up, next week is the start of the Security Consultant Insights series. This is a four-part weekly series each Tuesday at one o'clock uh, Sydney time, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you do have to register for this. This is a webinar series uh, sponsored by DAVCOR. Uh, but again, we've got about a dozen uh, security consultants, senior consultants looking at high security environments, uh, SCEC endorsed uh, products and the like. Uh, and the, the physical and cyber mix uh, in high security environments. So looking forward to that. And that's our second uh, year uh, for our, that series. Also on Tuesday afternoon, back for Tech and Sec Weekly at three o'clock Sydney time, uh, focusing on machine learning. I've got one guest, I've got a few others uh, lined up. Uh, we're gonna try and keep it on machine learning and AI, uh, but we have one guest confirmed, Jason Walker, the Chief Executive Officer with IntelliCare, and they've just been awarded a $100,000 grant uh, for their machine learning project. And that's with the Macquarie University and University of Sydney uh, as well. So that's on our Smart Cities channel uh, if you want to check more on that. We've also released a podcast and uh, interview with the Hyperfire startup out of Perth. Uh, this is uh, their Firebug intrusion detection system. And we spoke to Stefan Prendel and Tim Jones, the managing director. Uh, so again, you can check that out and uh, very interesting and access their white paper on terms of uh, the algorithms that they're applying uh, for network detection uh, systems. Closing on Monday, the uh, top women in security ASEAN region uh, awards. Uh, we've approaching over 100 nominations for this from the 10 nations of ASEAN. So uh, please, if you've got any uh, colleagues or part of your network is in the Southeast Asian region and you've got women in security, please get them to nominate uh, that are down to the last days. Uh, the update on podcasts, thanks to Jane Lowe in Singapore for her podcast on cyber influence and misinformation. That's with Stanford's uh, Professor Dr. Herbert Lin uh, from the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Uh, very interesting session, scary in, in many respects. Uh, and I mentioned uh, Hyperfire, that's also out as a podcast. Please check out the Cyber Risk Leaders magazine. We're preparing for July uh, edition. So if you've got any articles that you want to submit, please get them into us. Uh, and that's uh, at My Security Marketplace or My Security Media. You'll be able to do that. Thank you to our sponsors, a new sponsor, IT Glue. And this is focused on uh, managed service providers. There's a whole bunch of series uh, coming through. There's uh, on demand webinars and the like. So you'll see more from IT Glue uh, and uh, that particular series. And again, something to check out. Uh, also, to thank you to RSA and their secure ID suite. Uh, and it's interesting we have ISACA with us today. Uh, if you want to get some ISACA certifications and some training, uh, we've still got ALC working with us and their cybersecurity certification courses. Uh, if you want to support the channel, we have our Cyber War series. I'm wearing my Russian bear today. Uh, and uh, this is, follows the, uh, the APT series for uh, China, Russia and India. Uh, so thank you for that and the support that's been shown. So that's enough from me and the My Security Marketplace. And without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, Janai Marinkovic. There we are. And John Brandt. John and uh, Janai, thanks for joining us. Howdy. Nice to be here. Thanks, Chris. Beautiful. Um, look, 
let's dive into the report. I've got one slide here for the report. We won't uh, sort of take the audience through step by step, but we're going to dive into what that report is. And I'll just blow that up a little bit so we can see. But effectively, this is a global update on workforce efforts, uh, resources and budgets. Uh, we can see here for cybersecurity staffing, uh, the somewhat understaffed and significantly understaffed is leading out in front, uh, appropriately staffed about 35%, which isn't too bad. Uh, and then down here, figure four, uh, unified position, uh, sorry, unfilled positions. Uh, does the organization have unfilled open cybersecurity positions? And that's a yes at uh, over half. Uh, so very interesting in terms of, I would suggest that this is also uh, consistent to what we've been seeing here in Australia uh, and probably what else you've seen in the world. Uh, John, you were the practice lead uh, for, and I don't have your title right in front of me. Give me one second. Your title with ISARCA is I missed it because you've got enough qualifications, mate. You've got every <laughs> ISARCA qualification there is. Um, you, you are the uh, no, I don't have I don't have it in front of me. Maybe introduce your role with ISARCA and uh, yeah. and then how this report was put together. Sure thing. So uh, my, my role is information security professional practices lead. Yeah. So in this role, I can um, work uh, in the information security portfolio within the content development side. So uh, fourth quarter of, of 2020, um, we sent out a global survey out to uh, anyone with a, a security title or CISM and CSXP certifications through ISACA. Um, we had an, an, a 44% increase in respondents this year, which was absolutely wonderful um, and added, you know, and with some of the data that remained similar, just adds a lot of validation to what's going out there. Yeah, and I think um, in the report, about 93% were ISACA members. And uh, off the top of my head, ISACA's got, you know, quarter of a million members or thereabouts, uh, and I'm an ISACA member, so a little bit of a disclosure there as well. Uh, and Janaya, your your role uh, in the report as well? Sure. Um, absolutely. Uh, my name is, uh, for everybody, Janai Marinkovic, and I'm the chief, uh, virtual chief information security and chief technology officer for a company called uh, Tyro Security. Uh, I'm a member of the ISACA Emerging Trends Working Group, so I help study and analyze emerging uh, technology and uh, workforce trends. Uh, and um, I'm also uh, the founder um, of an apprenticeship program called the Nexiso program, which is designed to train people with no experience in technology into entry level GRC positions. Uh, so uh, a lot of what I'll have to say is, is colored by the fact of, um, you know, having to, to train junior people into, into some of these roles. Yeah. Well, maybe, John, the, the, the initial findings, because then we'll sort of uh, we've got two options, one to start on the methodology. Uh, but we've kind of touched on that in terms of this is the industry sort of feeding back uh, on some key areas. What were some of the key findings out of this that might have been slightly different from others? It it's, says much the same uh, as we've just pointed out uh, in terms of what the findings were for under underfilled uh, and open positions. So in full disclosure, right, when we when we wrote the report, one of the things we wanted to caution readers about is that this past year has been anything but normal. Right. So and, and we preface this in a lot of areas and just to exert some caution when we're interpreting results. Largely speaking, nothing has changed you know, yeah. at the end of the day. And that's really, so when we were putting the report together, we, we, you know, when you're reporting the same story year after year, you know, you start to, you know, kind of rack your brain, what's going on. And, and that's and ultimately what drove us taking a little different approach with this year's report and pulling in industry uh, to uh, the European and the US government a perspective, as well as uh, just one apprenticeship body. And, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that, you know, my uh, co uh, interviewee here, you know, he runs one as well and can add some value, some value there. Um, because I think at the end of the day, we just need to maximize the, the ways somebody could get into the workforce. Yeah. And how attractive is it? It can't be that cybersecurity is not attractive uh, or IT isn't attractive. Is it just because of the general explosion of IT, uh, the digitalization, the migration that everyone's taken to the cloud, that the workforce just hasn't been prepared 
uh, long enough ago. Uh, where do you think this kind of started and maybe the, the link to where we are now? And maybe, Janae, you do that uh, mentoring as well and, and development. Is it just a lack of interest or just a lack of people? The numbers just don't match where the industry is and what the industry requirements are. Sure. So it's certainly not lack of interest. Uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are interested in getting into cybersecurity. Um, there's tension that's going on. And we see that in the report that says that, hey, one of the most important skills, uh, things that we need for people coming on board is hands on experience. And so people who are junior and have no exposure, uh, you know, to the industry are, are having difficulty trying to find jobs because um, you need to have this level of experience. Uh, the problem uh, is uh, is a couple of things because it's easy to say, well, managers, why don't you just mentor more? Why don't you open more jobs for junior people? Uh, but you've got a couple of problems there. Uh, first, uh, managers and leaders are oversubscribed, uh, so they don't have enough time, uh, you know, um, allocated to be able to train and uplevel people. Uh, the second is is that it takes roughly six to eight months to get somebody fit for purpose from coming from a junior position to taking workload off of leaders. Mm. So by bringing junior people on, actually it's more work for people who are already overworked. And so you, we traditionally have been able to like try and rely on universities and job training programs and so forth to get people ready and up to speed, boot camps, certifications and so forth, but it's, it's simply not enough. Uh, you need to have hands-on experience doing client work, working for a company in order to be able to get some of these positions. And is it also because, and I open it up to both of you, is it because the technology is also changing on an ongoing basis too? You, you kind of, the principles are the same, but the technology and applying the principles also changes. There's an upskill. It's kind of why I like doing what I do with the, with the media. We're playing with the websites we're play, because the tech is always changing. There's always upgrades. There's always, you know, the patches to apply, but then there's different platforms coming out uh, and cloud computing has been another big one where it's gone from on-prem now we're in uh, cloud environments uh, but the, the 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 perimeter disappeared probably 10 years ago and now we're into mobile computing and, and edge devices and the like is it is it technology related as well that's changed uh in terms of that skill set required so uh it, 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 yes in that technology is ultimately a trigger uh, you know, yeah. so for, as an example, so with the explosion of, of, of cloud um, and connectivity, what you end up with is um, larger, more complex, distributed third party supplier networks, as an example. So it's not just the network that I'm controlling. It's all of the third parties with whom I partner. Um, and that uh, work is very difficult to try and automate or leverage technology to be able to analyze. You need boots to the ground to be able to do that. Uh, absolutely. The transition, you know, the uh, explosion of into, into movements like artificial intelligence and sensors and so forth, um, you know, require us to up level our skills. Um, but if you look at the job descriptions of what's out there today, uh, they're the same job descriptions that were out mm. there five years ago. So the yep. base skills of understanding cybersecurity and GRC are, are very similar. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of getting people up leveled and trained into those areas. Okay. And maybe, John, the pipeline challenges is something that the report touches on because again pipelines critical and then if you can align that to say that technology pipeline as well then you can start to align it I think even from a say an enterprise perspective you might look at your own technology strategy and then align the skill sets that you're going to need moving forward and, and cybersecurity is always going to be there uh, and just before you touch on that um, if anyone listening if you've got a question you can say good day wherever you're listening from the world uh, but uh, if you've got a particular question here or comment, uh, you're very welcome to contribute to the discussion. But yeah, John, maybe talk us through the pipeline uh, challenges that uh, the report highlights. So I, I think we, we just want to level set too. And Janai brought up some really good points here. And I think one of the struggles within the cyber industry at large is that there's just so many different types of work. Mm. Right. And within our the soccer report, right, when, when we survey a, a functional areas, so there's individual technical, individual non-technical, your manager and so on. So when we talk about pipeline challenges and specifically technical practitioners, 
you know, I was in a, uh, the, the the National in, uh, Initiative for Cybersecurity Education held a workshop this week, two day workshop. And one of the things that was coming up from the educators, and this is academics admitting it, that they focus on theory. Hmm. So it speaks to Janai's point that if you're only focused on theory and there's no real practical application, because it's in, employers want somebody who can do the job. And then, so there's ways to go about that, but there's there's some concern and we touch on it in the report is, you know, the U.S. has largely kind of been ahead in trying to corral this with their nice, uh, with their cybersecurity yeah. uh, framework, right? The European market is coming behind. They, they admitted that they were they were lagging. They're doing some very good work. What's going to be interesting at the end of the day, though, is how close or how different they are. Mm -hmm. Right. And then which way other markets levitate towards, because there we want to want to try to add some nor to normalize the workforce, so to speak. And I think that oftentimes we're we're too wrapped around the axle as to what are the the required skills per rather than the preferred skills. And mm -hmm. to Janai, right, because we and, and oftentimes Janai touched on it, right, job descriptions haven't changed. When we want, we can't talk about pipeline challenges without talking about the fact that although respondents largely are indifferent on on university degrees, that the majority of companies are still requiring them. So you're unnecessarily uh, basically slowing the pipe down and discarding with in today's HRM system, those applications are never even getting up to the to the recruiter or the HR or the hiring manager. Something that we've seen here in Australia is, and, and then you're right in terms of the universities are theory uh, focused, uh, whereas cybersecurity is more a sort of application. I mean, it still has theory behind it. It's not uh, to be disregarded. But as you say, the industry needs people straight away. You can't go into a three to four year degree. Uh, by the time <laughs> by the time you come out, the technology has already changed uh, as well. But we are seeing in Australia, uh, we do acknowledge the, the, the NICE fr uh, framework, but also we're seeing like socks being built in the university campus and the students are applying, you know, there's one over uh, in Perth, Edith County University has a, a, a new sock, a $3 million investment uh, just launched last year and applying the RSA uh, sort of platform in there. And again, when those students come out, they understand a theory, but they can also go into a, stock, a sock and, and start to, to operate. Are, are you seeing that as part of what you're, what you're doing out of this report where they align those skill sets to uh, the education. Uh, what, what are your observations there? And does the report cover that type of thing? Or maybe, and rephrase that question of how much, uh, how much is the industry demanding those skills out of the universities and, and out of the education to go straight into a SOC or straight into that role and be operational? So my understanding of this, and then I, I'm going to turn it over to Janai just for what she's seeing. But so yes, it there is some demand there. Um, I don't think it's substantial enough. And let's be honest, the size of the enterprise is going to determine mm -hmm. which way they go. Your larger enterprises, they've got these robust training departments. They can they can do this and, and even outsource with guidance. So. Where there has been some of that tension, uh, community colleges, your two-year degree programs become pretty important here. Um, what you mentioned, though, I actually had not heard, and, and I think that that's, that's a promising way forward. Here in the United States, and again, this is a global report, but speaking specifically of the United States, I, I really think that we, we put a lot of pressure and tell employers you need to change how you're hiring. What what has not been demanded yet is we're not changing how we're preparing individuals. Mm. And, and, and that's an unpopular message when universities are so important to, to the pipeline because it will, I truly believe if we fundamentally need to alter how that happens, because four years is just too long. The construct that you just mentioned then kind of puts it almost in a, um, in a trades type thing. You know, yeah. your electrician, your, your plumber, your HVAC, because then you're balancing the theor the theory and the book stuff with the practical hands on. And, and with that, you know, Jedi, obviously she's knee deep in that there. So I'll let her kind of uh, take it from there. 
I could not agree um, more. So the U.S. education system is very complex, right? Because you've got, um, as John mentioned, you've got your community colleges, you've got your continuing professional development, you've got your four-year universities and, and, and so forth. And so uh, what I've definitely seen at the college uh, level is more programs around professional development, people who are looking to transition into cybersecurity and having like a, a one-year program to get people there. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, the four-year programs and even the community colleges, uh, they still tend to rely a lot on internships um, and you know but not necessarily what you were mentioning meaning building their own internal enterprise security capability that uh, you would bring students in to ultimately run so you'll see that sometimes but but not on the level that that you're talking about uh, you know so uh, where I've seen the breakdown though is that uh, you can so let's say the sock that you're talking about which is good because I'm going to learn the tech um, but one of the things that the report highlighted is this uh, skills gap when it comes to human skills and human skills. And, I, and we always say this, right? It's the human skills and so forth. And we never really break out what exactly that means. You know, so it's not just your presentation skills, although that's very critical. Uh, the you know, you're not understanding how the business works. You're not understanding what a business process mm -hmm. is. You're not understanding uh, the cor corporate culture. You're not, you know, so there's so many things that go into, you don't know how to tell a story. And when you're dealing with the amount of data and when, and that we deal with and the complexity of the message that we're trying to get from C-suite all the way down to frontline workers, uh, you know, being able to tell stories and, and being able to present are absolutely critical skills to every facet of cybersecurity. And so, uh, you know, that's where one of the big areas that I actually was surprised about when we kicked off the apprenticeship program, because I thought, oh, I was going to struggle on the tech side in, in terms of getting people up to speed. And it wasn't tech. Um, it was on the human side uh, that we ended up seeing those gaps. And I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen any of the programs really dive in to helping to ultimately address that problem. It's an interesting one. We did an interview with uh, Alice White, again from Perth, but she's just got a new job with Atlassian uh, here in, in Sydney. But she had a target, but she transitioned from safety uh, and into security, and she was kind of quite across that. And there's a lot of alignment there. You mentioned uh, career transition. Is there any sort of careers that are that you find are aligning? Is there any trend yes. in that that comes through that you go, oh, we, we, if we're going to recruit anybody, we're going to recruit from over there? So, and I'm going to go away from the technical industries because I think those are, you know, pretty easy. Human resources people make amazing cybersecurity people, absolutely amazing. First off, they understand people. Um, second, they understand the business. Um, but the third is they see things in the data that we miss. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I was working with a chief people officer who's transitioned to cybersecurity. She's one of my partners. And uh, she was doing just a traditional identity and access management audit. And she saw cultural problems in looking at that data. I was looking at it as, well, you've got process problems. And so for, she saw cultural problems. And so, uh, uh, you know, human resources, people, and they understand how to deal with high confidentiality data, you know, so they they um, make really great cybersecurity people. A couple of other weird ones are um, healthcare. So nursing, uh, as an example, huh? if you think about it, they understand immune systems. They understand how to deal with things holistically. They understand how to deal with high stress environments. They know how to communicate with people when they're under stress. Uh, you know, so uh, nurses I found um, have uh, been have been pretty interesting in terms of uh, transitioning. And then one more weird one I'll give you, uh, and that is uh, uh, botanists and people who are in like landscape architecture, and it's <laughs> yeah. the same thing. You're dealing with plants. Um, and when you look at the environments that plants exist in, uh, you're dealing with uh, highly complex environments, viruses, uh, you know. So it, 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 I, I, um, I was working with someone who transitioned to security from uh, the landscape industry, and it was it was really interesting how quickly they caught on to certain things. But I'll, I'll end with that, uh, you know, when you start breaking cybersecurity down to its core, you'll actually yeah. find a lot of industries that there's natural transitions to. Very good. I think the other one was the quantified skills gap, John. Um, I'm specifically looking at uh, figure 12. What are the biggest skill gaps you've seen in cybersecurity professionals? 
Uh, and as Janai just mentioned, the soft skills is way out in front at 56% and then the security controls uh, endpoint. Um, was there any particular industries covered off on this or any other comments maybe from Janai, if you've got that in terms of that career transition uh, and how important that is uh, and maybe even where the associations play a role uh, in that, it's often a, a good entrance point. Uh, for people who are looking to career transition, they might look at the sort of industry associations to go to as well. Uh, anything specifically in this report about career transition? Jonathan, did you want to take this one? Sorry, John. Sure. So uh, largely speaking, uh, what's happening is companies are hiring from within the with, from within, pulling from other business units. So, um, and, and it speaks to some of what Janai had already touched on a couple of times. First of all, so those individuals are trusted persons. They're trusted employees. Yeah. They have already established, you know, their street cred, if they will. Uh, they understand the business. They understand the priorities. They understand the culture. Um, what we're starting to see time and time again, and, uh, and I moderated a panel at RSA, uh, where Greg Tuhill spoke to this, we can teach we can teach tech to just about anybody who's got who's who's what who wants to learn. Yeah. So now it's okay. So how do we kind of take a step back here and and start teasing out all of these other things that we know that your pipe your traditional pipeline suppliers have not been addressing? Um, oftentimes, the Janai hit on all the on the, all the presentation stuff. What's not necessarily covered it covered in there when it is a soft a soft skill uh, largely it, you could uh, call it either way but analytical and critical thinking and mm -hmm. i think largely what's what's happened here is even though in a, a student doesn't keep, may not get hands-on experience if the programs would devise a program to help help those individuals learn how to pull out the, the key nuggets of information, how to synthesize it, how to make judgments from it. That would go a, a long way. And, and that lends itself to why like people from the financial industry do very well when they come over legal law enforcement, right? Because procedurally, they kind of get it. Yeah. But don't you find that's, that's what cybersecurity is about, though? It's one of those uh, areas that you can come in from different angles and go, okay, I get that. You know, um, I like the landscaping one where you look at it from a general environment. We talk in that language. Uh, I mentioned uh, sort of the safety practitioner coming in because it's uh, highly regulated. You're still dealing with people, you're dealing with behaviors. Uh, and, you know, it's it's that growing regulatory environment around cybersecurity as well that it's also changing. And hence, you attract people from law uh, and the like. And I think it's that one of those sort of conceptual uh, domains. Where do you find, and again, same observations that I would say is we're seeing people moving internally, uh, but that's maybe, is that not a, a sort of a, uh, an outcome of the lack of skills? Because they not, they can't look external. They have right. to go with the resources that they've got. Um, and it's going to bring on the next uh, sort of topic we're going to discuss is on the funding as well. They may not have the resources or the funds to go outside. And if it's too hard to go outside, if it was easy, uh, everyone would be doing it. But we are seeing a trend that they go inside first, and it might be with an audit. It might be with a review or, you know, an ISO standard check and, and that type of thing. Um, is, is that the outcome? That's kind of the balance that we're seeing is uh, they go internal first because, the, that you know, as this report says, there's a lack of external resources. Well, I think largely it's their frustrated one. And I, whereas I can't speak to this, this is more of a hypothesis, but if you have somebody in your business that's coming from a non-technical career field, you could theoretically bring them in cheaper than what you would have to pay somebody that you're going out into the market, paying fair market price right now. Yeah. So, so there's and, that, bu that business aspect that you can't overlook. And another one is, it, I mentioned the growing regulatory environment in cybersecurity. So it's forcing businesses and also the threat landscape as well. It's forcing businesses to look at cybersecurity as a business problem, uh, hence, you know, they're having to deal with it. Otherwise, they would just ignore it uh, if it wasn't core business. Um, the last uh, sort of area, or, sorry, a key area would be the cybersecurity funding. Uh, and the question here is, has cybersecurity funding reached an apex? Uh, John, maybe introduce us in terms of what this area was looking at to cover. 
Sure. So um, this largely for our re- for our listeners refers to Figure Twenty Three in the report. Yeah. Um, and, and large it, and the tagline is is that although funding increase fund, uh, budgets are still going up, they're not going up at the at the pace that they have been. So when you look at this over six years, there is a leveling that has happened, with the peak being back in two thousand eighteen. So I, I, when we talk about skills and funding, something admittedly that was, you know, I didn't consider with the question bank this year and it will next year is how training is funded differs by enterprise. And, and we can't overlook that right now because depending on who's foot in the bill is going to really drive some of their solutions. And I think that that's a logical next step because since I've taken this report over uh, where we had open, right? The sky is falling. Isn't helping anybody. We understand <laughs> that the supply demand uh, bal- curve is way out of whack, but so I, you know, I sock and others, our responsibilities to start adding some meaningful data to, to inform decision makers. How do we start to really make, make data informed decisions move in there instead of just throwing something at the wall and seeing if it works or not. Yeah. I, again, Janae, your your thoughts on that, particularly in your role as a virtual CTO, CISO, mm-hmm. you, you can you know saying, "Oh, we need to spend more money," just doesn't cut it anymore. No, uh, certainly not without the right business justification. <laughs> <enough>. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I want to delineate between training budgets, um, which have also kind of started to wing off, and and I think part of the reason is is that there's this perception that I can go to uh, you know all of these online sites and be able to download training for ninety nine ninety five, uh, and so uh, and that means that my people are trained. So uh, you know you might end up seeing budgets kind of drop right there, you know, versus the the budgets uh, for you know running and operating your information security management system, and so uh, you know I think a couple of things. I think first off, um, the whole fear, uncertainty, and doubt of people being terrified of the the hacker. I think that's waning just a little bit now, and part of the reason is is that um, it, uh, companies have been able to survive massive breaches and come back. Um, so uh, companies feeling like they have to go out and spend a lot of, uh, of money based on fear that's starting to, to wane. Um, and really the more focus is around compliance, uh, either regulatory and statutory compliance or compliance. And this is the big one based on my customers and my clients. They're the ones that are actually driving a lot of these budgets. And um, executive leaders um, are far more savvy in the world of cybersecurity now. So they really want to see a good return on investment you know, for the dollars that they spend, especially Especially um, given that technology changes so much, you know what they don't want to see is a whole, you know, me removing, re-architecting, redesigning, redeploying my architecture every eighteen months. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're they're not comfortable with that, so they expect, uh, you know, to you to run a pretty lean shop um, and be able to demonstrate that uh, the money that I'm investing as an executive actually returns, uh, you know, a, a relatively secure, defensible environment. It, you interested you you touched on the training and the on demand and how you can get down to ninety nine dollars. It has put a lot of uh, sort of pressure on prices uh, and the like. What about things like certifications and and how certifications are, are viewed these days as well? I think uh, there's always a, a mixed commentary on certifications and whether they're worthwhile, but I think it just demonstrates uh, an on, a, a dedication to ongoing learning. It doesn't necessarily say you know everything, but at least you're trying. Um, maybe, John, you've got uh, more certifications there. Your uh, CISM, <laughs> CDP, SC, CISA. I mean, maybe just talk us through even your mindset going through those of, um, yeah, what, what makes so- you go to so many certifications and how do you think uh, that, the importance of certification you can't i'll tell you right now you can't say certifications aren't important when you've got that many but, but well, what's no, your thinking so the, around that so so the, you know um about when i just after i got hired at isaka you know we had there was a study that we had done and it was it was about a 50 50 split 51 40 51 49 i think to be specific as to whether enterprises loved or hated certifications at the end of the day the market is driving it when to Janai's point, we have job descriptions out there that are are called for ridiculous amounts of competencies and technologies and certifications. So 
it drives people that way. Um, absent of anything else out there, certifications ed exist as a attestation of somebody's abilities, right? Knowledge, skills, or abilities, depending on the type of certification. Um, so the challenge is, is that, you know, whereas the industry is driving that, they, you know, the industry in, in enterprises at large are going to, uh, you know, you're going to live by the certification or die by the certification. So obviously some are in more favor than others. Um, so from an employer standpoint, you know, I think that they look at some of the more certifications you potentially have, the better, the, the more it's worth even interviewing you, right? Because there's a, there's a, there's a cost of of, of uh, you know, bringing somebody on or just, you know, going through the HR process. For the applicant, what's really, you know, from my perspective, my, my it it's concerning because administratively and, and financially, there's a burden to maintain all these certifications. Yeah, right. Some enter, some companies reimburse. So then it goes back to, you know, what Janiah talked about, there's a cost of doing business and, uh, you know, in a seller's market, I think companies are kind of almost have to do that because the individual's like, well, if you want, if this is lucrative to you, then you're going to pay the bill, you know, or I'll just let it lapse. Cause I think at every stage of your career, you have to start determining which ones you're going to let sunset and lapse because it's, yeah. you know, based on where, what your aspirations are. I think it's also time related. I did a bachelor's degree in security, so I resisted certifications for a long, long time. Uh, and then after a while, you you know, no one's, well, one, there was a couple of changes. One is the degree gets old. Uh, and two, um, it became less important. You know, we talked about where universities were in the learning journey. Uh, they became a little bit less important or weren't as relevant. Janai, maybe your comments on on that because we just touched on say the cheap the cheap on demand training you can do but even in you know the microsoft azure and the aws training you can do online you know and get a, a azure security kind of certificate uh, and most of it's free uh, is a certification a good one to go okay well i'll test my body of knowledge against a known uh, association or something that is more recognized What's, what's your link to the certifications uh, and, you know, obviously being, uh, we're all a bit conflicted with being ASACA members but that do certifications, but yeah, where, where do you sit in all of that? Sure. So I look at uh, certifications through a couple of different lenses. One is, is uh, what uh, John had mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, this is a demonstration of uh, the body of knowledge that I've acquired, you know, so there's uh, that part, but it's also a marketing and branding exercise. Uh, and so really understanding the industry that you want to target, ultimately the job that you want to target. Uh, you know, so as an example, if I want to know that I want to be a chief information security officer one day and these are the industries that I want to follow, then ultimately you want to get the certifications that help lend itself towards actualizing that path. Uh, if I know that I'm going to be in forensics and I know that I'm going to testify in court and that I want to run a big forensics lab, then I need to land the forensic certifications that enable me to be able to be competent in terms of testifying in court and run a big lab. And so, you know, to me, it's it's all about knowing yourself and, and to some extent the journey that you want to take and then identifying the certifications that are required to, you know, meet uh, meet that, uh, that vision. Because if I want to work in uh, U.S. government, there's certain certifications I'm going to have to get. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I know that there's a lot and it can be like kid in a candy shop sometimes looking at all of the opportunities and so forth. But I think it, because uh, and Johnny mentioned this as well, that it's an investment of time, you know, and time is one of the most precious resources that we have because we can't recreate it. Uh, you know, so if you're going to invest your time in doing that instead of investing the time in, say, for instance, another area, um, then make sure that it's a certification that helps you actualize that goal. Yeah, I think you need to know where you're going. Uh, you're getting the afternoon sun in there, um, <laughs> Janelle. <Janata. laughs> It's, it's kind it's, of like I can see you leaning, <laughs> leaning the, with the sun. It's it, burning. That's okay. <laughs> you can put you can change your view if you want, or you put a pair of sunglasses on. I get the same thing here on our afternoon sessions, so no problems at all if you need to change your camera. Um, but I am just going to finish it off. You've got five minutes of sun movement to go. Um, <laughs> Bearing with me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> so let's keep the audience wanting a little bit more uh, for them to actually go and download the report. And unfortunately, uh, and the PR team for us, Zach, and I, I always, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine. I'd uh, prefer to be able to have our these reports on our marketplace. But unfortunately, you've got to go straight to ISACA and download it direct. Yeah, and it's only personal copies available. But keeping them wanting some more, um, maybe just let's finish up on the on the conclusion. Business as usual is not working. Uh, John, the conclusions out of the report, and maybe what's got planned for uh, this year's survey uh, is to, to avoid much of the same. But yeah, what are the, what are some of the key takeaways from the reporting in in its conclusions? I. I I think that the big takeaway is business as usual is dead, right? It's no longer applicable. Um, we've seen that 2020 was largely the year of, of reinventing everything, right? With, with the global pandemic, businesses had to change everything. I think everything is back on the table. So every aspect from how we train, how we recruit, how we hire, how we retain talent, everything should be back on the table. Um, I also, you know, when, we talk about a seller's market. Like what concerns me is when we see that budgets are leveling out and, and granted the budgets, when they get asked the question, what we don't know is how, what exact, what are the components of it? Is the training part of that? Because in some places it is some places it's a dedicated budget, but it, who's paying for the head count as well. At some point, like the industry at large cannot sustain the salaries as they continue to go up. It, it truly, like something has to give there, or it's going to be this big push towards emerging technologies, which Janai has talked talk, touched on before. But then all that does is kind of rearrange. It's a shell game of talent. We mm. move them from one area, and we're moving them to another. And how long does it take us to upskill them or reskill to fulfill that other that other area? Well, maybe on that, Janai, your thoughts on, and I did an interview with, uh, I'll give him a plug, Sentinel One yesterday, you know, they, they pushed themselves forward as an autonomous AI uh, endpoint uh, protection platform. So the, the more uh, ML uh, and AI uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about the cloud computing, is there any, you know, real core trends that you see, you know, as a takeaway from the audience listening that might be one, either interested in cybersecurity or trying to sort of deal with their own skill gap, uh, how much into the data science and the uh, sort of the AI ML type spaces will we need to be, or do you foresee? Oh, no, no, AI uh, is, is okay, so there's two. One is cloud, uh, cloud is foundational, cloud is, can no longer be considered an emergent technology. Uh, one of the, the downsides to a lot of the training programs out there is that they are so heavily focused on laptops, workstations, and physical servers, and do not get into um, or involved in uh, you know understanding the security issues that, that come with cloud. And when I say security issues, I don't mean just protection, I also mean defense. Uh, you know, so so hands down, you know, people need to become more competent in in cloud. Uh, but the other one is is AI, uh, and so AI again um, is is moving past this emergent. We're already in the the fourth wave um, of of artificial intelligence, so you've got that. But you know, the problem is is that it is embedded into too many systems. Uh, it is making you know critical decisions on behalf of your uh, your environment. There are very few people in our industry that understand how to design security into a thinking system. There are fewer people who know how to defend an attack against a thinking system. And m very important, we don't have a lot of GRC people who understand how to audit it. You know, so uh, and, you know, for our social justice warriors uh, that are out there, there's this really interesting intersection mm -hmm. between GRC security and artificial intelligence because, you know, fairness and transparency and accountability and, you know, all all line up into, into many of the things that an auditor would look at when analyzing the effectiveness um, of, of an algorithm. And so bias starts to come into play. And that's something that auditors would pick up. So if you're somebody who's really interested in looking at sys thinking systems that may have really big societal impacts, that's an auditor that's going to pick that up. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, I, I, at this point, it needs to be foundational to every cybersecurity person's, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, job curriculum. Uh, and I would say in the schools as well, you know, so in our uh, apprenticeship program, we had a month 
uh, where we had, uh, his name is Dr. Celeste Natangwa, and he, uh, PhD in physics, and he came and he taught our students for a month um, in the fundamentals of auditing AI. Uh, right. So I, I would say that's a, that's a big one. So, yeah, there's quite a lot there to unpack. I think from a cloud perspective, it's very business orientated. So there's more traditional cybersecurity. But then when you're talking about auditing AI, I think we've seen there's a bit of a change in cybersecurity as well, where you're now talking about uh, data privacy uh, and uh, and online, you know, the operational technology, the safety aspect, the IT, OT uh, crossover as well. It's kind of what we're going to be covering off next week with our security consultant series. I really want to get a sense of the physical and the cyber people and how they are talking to each other because that's changing as well. The physical people are coming across. Uh, the electronic people are now dealing with, you know, cloud networks and, and uh, edge devices. Uh, rather than you know, sort of standalone, sort of closed circuit television on an analog system, that's all now edge devices on a network. So they are coming into the cybersecurity field. So the, it becomes increasingly competitive uh, as well. And then you've got the vendor side, all trying to sell a product that you know will be kind of on the bandwagon of this. Of you know, we can do it faster. We can make autonomous decisions for you, and you need less people. So it's a really interesting time it's going to be a, i keep saying it it's a very interesting decade uh the world has changed thanks to covid uh, 19 uh, and it's a permanent change to a hybrid workforce so uh, not only does it become more important cyber security but then we have these type of issues that have been with us for a little bit of time uh, in terms of the skill sets uh, the constant change uh, and the constant uh, need to attract new people into the industry and competing against other industries too you know i talked about privacy, data science, uh, we've got to get them in across uh, and as champions for cybersecurity because I'm sure they can do a lot of the role uh, along the way. So maybe uh, let's just finish off with some closing comments from you both uh, and maybe what you hope for for 2021, 2022 uh, in terms of uh, how this report will contribute to the sector. Janai, maybe start with you and then we'll finish off with John. Sure, sure. So first off, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, the, the report. Uh, you know, the report, uh, you know, was definitely, uh, you know, one of the, the triggers, you know, that helped us to even think about building out the program. Uh, you know, what I hope that comes uh, across is that people start uh, both in terms of employers as, as well as the education system, start thinking very differently about how you get 3.5 million people trained uh, um, up trained and upskilled, you know, into the world of cybersecurity, uh, you know, that small and medium sized businesses uh, start, you know, also play a part here because they can give opportunities to junior people, whereas bigger companies may not. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, I think for me, that's that's the big, uh, you know, push um, as well as diversity. Uh, I know that we there wasn't a big push in terms of diversity with this report, uh, but uh, it does illustrate that, you know, with this gap that we have this employment gap, we also have this historic opportunity to increase our numbers across the board when it comes to uh, improving diversity in the industry. Very good. And, and John, closing comments, and uh, are you going to do a third year next year? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm in it for the long haul, Chris. So um, I'll just touch on what Janai said. So, you know, I, Isaka did, we made a concerted effort to pull the the uh, diversity piece out of this report because uh, Isaka actually stood up a, 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 a one in tech um foundation and that is their their charter is they're looking specifically at that so um you know for 2021 i'm hoping that the that the data if, that we get at the end of this year that be for next year's report that we're going to see a decrease in time to in, in uh in time to staff right from the the time that you the open rec to get somebody in the job and that understaffing actually changes um you know, I also then just the, the plug is that we just need greater involvement across the board and we need to, we have to think a little broader. I think, um, especially with rural parts, they are part of, of the minority that's out there and, and it really is, a, they're a disadvantaged population. And I know, you know, there's a lot of people who are banking big on 5G. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a skeptic in that in, in that regard. You know, there's some pushback from those communities to even get the technology in there. So we just we have to do better at all levels. Um, every industry is being affected by technology. 
You know, and there's no better person than Janai who, who sees this day in and day out. So it's not just about our industry anymore. It's about, you know, the, the better we do with uh, with tomorrow's generation of leaders in, in raising their sea of digital literacy, the better off we all are. Yeah. Well, look, we're seeing signs of it uh, here in Australia in terms of the curriculum starting to change. But uh, again, I think it still happens in pockets. It doesn't happen as broadly uh, and as structurally uh, as uh, as we need it to be. And that's in a federated system, much like the United States. So I'm sure you're seeing the same uh, thing. And you're both East Coast and West Coast uh, and here in Sydney. So we've given it a bit of an international flavour. And uh, so no doubt uh, everyone else is seeing very similar things. So look, on that note, uh, we've gone just up to 50 minutes. So uh, pretty much almost on the hour. We've seen um, the uh, uh, Californian sun come into play. So thank you so much. Um, and on that note, uh, we've uh, been talking about the Osaka Annual Research Report, State of Cybersecurity with Janai Marinkovic uh, and uh, John Brandt uh, there in, uh, in the US. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, this will go out as a Cybersecurity Weekly podcast, uh, but I do appreciate you coming on our Tech and Sec Weekly. Thanks, Chris. Thank Good on you. I'll put you backstage uh, and I'll just finish off. Thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you. Ciao. Okay, very interesting. Um, and uh, just to finish off, as I do, uh, our report of the day, uh, obviously we've been talking about the ISACA report, um, but uh, the sustainable IT, this is from Cap Gemini, uh, and this is uh, on the marketplace as well. Uh, and this is looking at sustainable IT. And interesting, we just kind of touched on it a little bit, uh, applying an environment-focused approach across the enterprise IT landscape uh, and looking at uh, both the hardware and devices, network and communication systems, applications, uh, and uh, cloud computing, uh, and the impact on the environment. And it was interesting, I think Elon Musk uh, took Tesla off Bitcoin because of the environmental impact. So we're talking about green IT and sustainable IT. So worth having a look at uh, from Capgemini. And again, that's available on the MySecurity Marketplace. Just as a highlight for next week, uh, the Security Consultant Series, Insight Series starts on Tuesday. Uh, that's at one o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that's going to be every Tuesday for the th first four Tuesdays of June. Uh, and like I said, we've got about a dozen consultants there. You can go to the MySecurity Marketplace and register. Uh, and that's uh, a closed uh, webinar session week to week. And then I'll be back on Tuesday with a couple of interviews. But the first one will be with Jason Walker, the Chief Executive Officer with IntelliCare and their $100,000 machine learning grant uh, with the Macquarie University and Sydney uh, Un University of Sydney. So looking forward to that. That's enough from us here at the Marketplace. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll be back on Tuesday uh, with our Tech and Sec Weekly. Thank you.